welcome to Industry 4.0. Hola, 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 we them boys of I4O. This is episode 22, recorded on Thursday, <laughs> and we have a lot to talk about this week. So, just to kind of, just to kind of do a recap of the last week, we had the Amazon conference, we had the Apple conference the week before that, and now we have Google's conference this week. But first and foremost, I am joined today by a full party. I have Ryan Irvin. Jeff and Kyle today. How is everybody doing tonight? Yeah, hey. doing great. How about you? <laughs> I'm well. I'm doing really I, I, good. I too am doing well, sir. Yeah, same here. Yeah, me too. All right, nice. Well, especially after the Google conference, all the new toys that we'll have to play with and share with our viewers at one point once they finally arrive. But we can talk about that during the second half. But to start off the first half, we have a bit of news um, just to roll through the first topic, there was a uh, chief of staff for President Trump reportedly using a compromised smartphone for months. And at the time of the reporting, it's unclear if any data was obtained from uh, their personal smartphone. This is John Kelly. Um, I'm not, he's their chief of staff. So um, the point of the article isn't so much, or that we're focusing on, isn't so much the politics of it so much as it is using an out-of-date smartphone beyond its supported lifetime. Because as you guys know, smartphones are supported by the manufacturer for up to X number of years for both OS updates and security updates. Um, but I'm, I'm curious to hear some of your thoughts on, on this. Because it says he was reportedly using an iPhone. So I guess it's a little bit better than if, say, he was using like a ZTE or like some third like third party lesser known android brand that will never get updated but i'm curious to see if anybody have, have any your thoughts on this uh topic just to start off the show so i'll take a stab if, if you guys are okay with that um okay. the, the i didn't really think of it until we started the episode i was going to go in a different direction but i kind of um something just kind of dawned on me we, we've talked about a lot in the past especially earlier on in episodes uh how we feel like one of the most important things for whether we're worried about security or worried about net neutrality or anything, the most important thing is making sure that not only is the public aware, but that the, you know, protection on the internet, protection of the internet is all, if the government doesn't understand or fully know, then, then can we be assured that we'll, that we'll be prepared and act precautionary instead of reactionary? Mm -hmm. And I think this is a case that you, where you can point at just sometimes, and I'm not using, we've seen it before. This isn't the only case where sometimes it's just certain people don't realize. And it's not because they're doing it on purpose. It's not because anyone is trying to, uh, for whatever reason, they just, they feel comfortable using that device. They don't take into account the other things and they keep using that device. They don't realize the risks that are at hand. And I think it's, if the general public isn't, knowledgeable, but also the people who are trying to protect us also aren't knowledgeable. That means that education on these topics needs to be more readily available, needs to be out there, needs to be taken seriously as well. And it's clearly not just us, but by everybody, but not, not just the general tech consumer, but by everybody who would ever use tech. Right. And um, it's just another thing that like, it's just another thing to add into the pile of like security issues and things like that. Now, um, I'm under the impression that I, I, I know I don't have to be reminded. I know Irvin is the same way, but we're both on the bleeding edge of everything. But it does pay off to download software updates for your phone. And it does pay off to um, stay up to date with your contract and get the latest phone when you're due for an upgrade. Because sure, the phone might still work, but like we were talking about, it's not getting security updates. It's not getting things that are helping it run. So... I mean, it's it's something that's a, it's a quick topic to something I wanted to touch on, but this stuff is important and it is important that uh, especially politicians and people holding important seats of office are kind of using modern devices and staying up to date with security because it's important to us and to their constituents. So I just wanted to just talk about that briefly at the beginning, but um, 
we do have a couple other articles about some some fun stuff from Apple as well. Um, so there is, a, and by fun stuff, you can take that with a grain of salt. There's <laughs> a um, there is an update to uh, Mac OS High Sierra, the new operating system that they have for a update for a fix for a disk utility bug and keychain vulnerability. And Irvin, I know you were talking about this before the show, and yeah. um, it's a bit. It, it involves uh, it, uh, people can encrypt or it can decrypt the Apple file system into plain text, which is definitely not a good thing in any situation ever for someone's entire hard drive. Yeah, so um, just to give you a little background, so Mac OS and Sierra was just released um, end of September, I think September 25th was the official release date. Um, and when people upgraded it to uh, this uh, brand new op operating system, their uh, SSDs were automatically converted to Apple's new uh, brand new Apple file system. It was supposed to improve uh, performance and also reliability and, and as well as security on those SSDs. And uh, recently, uh, there's a uh, software vulnerability that was found uh, where if you chose to encrypt that uh, SSD with the new Apple file system, uh, if would um, show you what password you use to encrypt that hard drive uh, in plain text in disk utility. Um, so Apple released a, a, a emergency software patch today to fix that vulnerability, uh, good for them. Uh, but yeah. if you're already affected, the only way uh, to fix this issue, even after the update, is uh, copy everything off the hard drive that was encrypted, back it up, erase, and start from scratch. Um, so nice. yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh man, like this, it's it's all this is through their their new uh, file storage system. You were saying, right? Yeah, so. all through Apple file system that they launched mm. with officially launched in macOS High Sierra. Uh, so they moved off of the HFS plus that they were using and that that file system is over uh, at this point, I think 30 years old. So uh, they yeah, wanted to des design something that was meant for the modern world of, of SSDs inside of laptops mm -hmm. as well as computers to better optimize uh, this file system behind the scenes that keeps track of all your files. So there's little bumpy, bumpy uh, roads ahead for uh, this new file system because it's a critical part of the operating system it is understandable that there are going to be some issues that pop up but this is sort of uh something that cool. sh shouldn't have happened but it, it did but good on yeah. apple for fixing it uh so quickly and this is an example of companies taking the correct steps to resolve a security breach unlike some of the other companies that we've covered in past weeks it's good to it's refreshing to see that someone is is taking this as seriously as it is and um pushing this forward because this is their customers that they're worried about so they need to yeah. make this first and foremost in their in priority and i think that honestly it, if, if it happened to anybody like as much hate as i get for the company they are like it of course it's apple that is so quick to resolve this because their MacBooks are very streamlined and very well maintained by the uh, security updates. Yeah, um, I, I agree with you guys. It's nice that they got this resolved within you know less less than two weeks from its release date. I think it was September 25th, if I'm not mistaken. Um, mm -hmm. It is a little bit concerning that this got out there in the first place. I know um, I tend to say things like this when we do our podcast, but the big company like Apple makes me a little concerned that they're jumping the gun a little bit to get their product to market faster to yeah. stay competitive as opposed to really thoroughly checking what they're putting out there. Um, but I'm glad to see that this happened within two weeks that it's been patched and, you know, realized as opposed to letting it go yeah. under the radar to keep a good public image. Mm -hmm. And it's good that it was just today, just at the, at the publishing of this article made public. So it was right. so it was uh, responsibly disclosed, which which I like. Right. It wasn't someone. So the person who found this issue was a responsible or what we call white hat hacker, uh, which that uh, who uh, responsibly disclosed this vulnerability to Apple. 
and then waited for it to be publicly released about information about this hack once the update was available on the map. And unlike the kid in Budapest, I'm sure he wasn't arrested. <laughs> no, as well. Yeah, it wasn't raided by yeah. uh, agents in his house. Yeah. 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 So I'd say luckily the... he wasn't punished for being good. Yeah. yeah, I think Apple has a bug bounty program. Yes, for they stuff do. Like this. So yeah. I'm sure he uh, walked Although it doesn't, yeah. Them. Although it doesn't compare as well as it does to other companies, and mm -hmm. you and you would think that Apple would be the one paying high, uh, the big bucks out because they have so much money in the bank, but that's not the case. So a yeah. lot of people have been arguing that Apple should up their bug bounty values, especially for iOS. Just looking at how much people actually use that operating system and just putting as much eyes on it as possible and just getting people trying to hack it. Uh, so there's been a lot of argument in terms of getting that bug bounty uh, to be increased so that it makes it more secure for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but that's that's really good to hear. And um, if it could have happened anyway, that's the best possible way for it to be disclosed. Yep. Um, but carrying straight on, uh, we have a little bit more news from Intel in there ever ongoing struggle to keep up with the rapidly encroaching Ryzen CPUs and to kind of bes to kind of wipe their name clean of the of the criticism they've been getting in the past few months and they released their new um, their new coffee like uh, CPUs the and this um this Anantec article is a roundup of just the numbers and the processing power of these two CPUs and they're looking like they're pretty serious contenders in terms of a solid upgrade path in comparison to previous generations of Intel chips. I'm, I'm curious to see more of how these run in the benchmarks and things like that. These, this looks to be more of just a, a pure spec sheet at the time. Yeah. Um, so the people have, have, have had uh, these chips in hand to test and review. So there are some reviews out there comparing okay. them to other um, parts out there. And this is pretty much the main competitor for, this is pretty much Intel's answer to uh, the Ryzen series. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it pretty well compares to what Ryzen has uh, been, has released. Uh, the main uh, differentiator that, that uh, biggest jump that was from the last year's uh, KB Lake, is that now all i5 and i7 uh, CPUs come with uh, six cores instead of four. So previous <laughs> generations, both Skylake and Cabby Lake came with four cores. And then mm -hmm. depending on what you wanted, you can get hyper threading. So that could be up to eight threads. Uh, but in this case, the highest end i7 now goes up to 12 threads uh, for uh, the same price. Um, as it was last year's for eight of those threads. So uh, if you use a lot of multitask or apps that can utilize a lot of cores um, like video editing, uh, Photoshop, things like that, uh, rendering, um, it could it, it saw a significant uh, jump in terms of performance. Things for uh, like games and stuff. They didn't see that much of performance gain because games aren't really optimized for that multi-core uh, mm -hmm. workload. They're really just reliant on the graphics card. Um, but overall, it is good imp uh, uh, improvement over last year's. Um, one thing to note is that if you want to upgrade to these brand new 8th generation CPUs and you currently have a 6th or 7th generation uh, CPU in your system you it, although it uses the same exact mounting socket uh, you cannot upgrade uh, you have to get a new motherboard to upgrade which sucks yes yeah. yeah, so it could they change something significant in the background which where the motherboard manufacturers had to change the architecture so yeah, it looks it, like it's now running off a z370 socket yeah, yeah. The, 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 no, no, the, the socket is LGA 1151. The Z370 is the chipset, uh, which was oh, an upda yeah. updated from the Z270 chipset. Um, but the socket is exactly the same. But the way that the memory configuration is, as well as the PCI lanes, 
um, they ha you have to get a brand new motherboard, which sucks. Even though this, the actual CPU could fit in there, you can mount it, it just won't boot. Um, yeah. And they, they said that they couldn't solve that issue with just a, a, a motherboard, a BIOS update. They had to uh, release brand new hardware, which sucks. Because if you want to upgrade to these new ones, you have to upgrade your entire motherboard uh, with it. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm looking at the specs for all these new ones this 8th generation. and they, I, I mean, they're impressive, but they're like not substantially yeah. different from what the previous generations was. I think it seems like because Cabby Lake had so many hyper-threading issues, they kind of rushed this next batch out to try to patch that. Yeah, this is definitely kind of a knee-jerk reaction to Ryzen and adding more cores to kind of bring back the rapidly deteriorating... Um, amount of creatives who are leaving Intel CPUs in favor of Ryzen CPUs because they tout better performance for the CPU, just for just raw CPU power. Yeah. They may not be as good for gaming, those Ryzen CPUs, but they're better for like productivity and running mm -hmm. um, like photo editing and uh, rendering software. I was watching stuff a, like that. Yeah, I was watching a video by Linus earlier today, Linus Tech Tips, and he did, he did uh, a little overclocking on these eight generation he's like eight we had no issue overclocking to five gigahertz uh, at yeah. all at, at stable That's for um <laughs> these i i7 the highest end i7 that they had um wow. with with fairly normal uh thermals at that level of performance um like exactly what i was wondering about because i know there are all those issues with the uh 7700 with overclocking and having it basically like have a meltdown when you did that yeah the most terrifying thing on online with those um seventh gen cpus was how they would people would delid them so that way like they could put on a better thermal paste which yeah. was like terrifying as you watch them like crack the lid off of a cpu using this like 3d <laughs> printed tool and I'm just like, oh my god, what are you doing? You could, <laughs> yeah. it's like a three hundred dollar processor. But um, the one thing that is uh, important to note that the article here, the Anantech review mentions about these is um, not only is the performance better and there's more cores, but their single core performance is also better than previous generations by a bit, by a noticeable amount, which is good because that means it'll be better for. It could help with gaming, take some of the stress off excuse me, off of the CPU and, or off of the GPU, I mean, and um, it's, it's a good, it's a good reaction, but I think it's like a one step too late type thing because mm -hmm. now Ryzen's got their foot in the door yeah. and Ryzen's well, yeah. already being touted as the CPU for the creative type. Yeah. But according to Ars Technica, so I'm looking, there's a second article in the show notes about the same Intel Coffee Lake uh, i7, but apparently uh, this Intel Coffee Lake, the six core version, even beats the eight core Ryzen um, in many no, wow. content creation apps. So that's fairly impressive that it even mm -hmm. beats an eight core Ryzen. A six core processor beats an eight core processor. So it's not all about cores, it's about the overall performance and how well these pieces of software that you use every day. I know people like to talk about all these synthetic benchmarks and stuff, but like real world usage is what actually matters at the end mm -hmm. of the day, like how well your apps that you use daily that you rely on perform. And if yeah. a six core processor can beat an eight core, then that's and what that goes, people... Yeah, that goes back to what I was saying, is that that's where you're gonna notice the single core yep. performance increases versus just adding more cores to solve the problem. Sure. If you can, if you have a more powerful single core, then you're going to have a much more smooth computing experience in terms of being able to run what you needed to do. Yeah, and that's I think where they're beating Ryzen mm -hmm. at I, the single core yeah. thread. So it's just another um, optimization update. Uh, yeah, it matches with the name Lake, right? So Sky Lake was the first one, Cabby Lake, and then Coffee Lake. I think the next one is supposed to be a significant change in terms of the architecture um but okay. we'll, we'll just have to see if yeah. they move out down to the 10 nanometer process uh, which yeah. should improve the thermals and uh improve performance quite a bit but we'll see what when those gets get released next year but yeah it's, and I, uh, i'm happy to see just as a, a note to close this out i'm happy to see ryzen and intel fighting it out because Again, it benefits everyone, right? Mm -hmm. There's finally someone who can 
fight Intel and, and make them in, innovate faster than they probably would have been if they were the top dog and no one was uh, at the bottom trying to poke them, you know, trying to trying to yeah, they've got take their spot. For the first time in years. Yeah, real competition. Yeah. yeah. And it's coming from AMD. So, <laughs> but um, <laughs> we, we talked about in how many different uh, arenas in this podcast, how important competition is to keep pushing people to the next level. So mm -hmm. I agree, even though clearly I don't know as much about this as you guys do. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's, you're right. I mean, the, the Intel processor being, you know, those guys being pushed more to be more creative, to be, uh, to be stronger is always just good for everyone. Yeah. Cause you see that sticker everywhere on, on laptops, exactly. on desktops, on, school computers on literally anything even like i've seen it on like books or people get a cpu and they just stick it somewhere and like you see it on the street but like <laughs> it, it was intel cpus are everywhere <laughs> i have seen this <laughs> i have seen a core i7 sticker on a bench in a park before i was gonna say like a sewer place has intel yeah. inside, <laughs> like, yeah, intel inside. <laughs> but um yeah I was gonna... we all float down here yeah <laughs> I was going to say, uh, kind of going off of what you guys were saying, like for the audience who's less interested in the computer parts, they can now finally wake up because we're going to move on to something that's Ooh. a little bit more interesting. Um, the fully driverless cars that are going to be announced by Waymo, uh, Google's self-driving car company. Um, they're apparently going to launch a commercial ride sharing service powered by these cars with no human safety drivers as soon as as the fall. And it's important to note that this is happening in Phoenix, Arizona, because Arizona, if I remember correctly, has the laws in place to allow driverless cars without safety drivers. Um, I think from that, that's just from um, from memory and from reading up on stuff in prior um, news breaks about this yeah, type there, of self-driving tech. Yeah, there are several states that have been fairly lax in terms of people testing or companies testing self-driving uh, technology. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, Arizona's has been as one of them. I know Nevada is one as well, uh, yeah. has been uh, fairly lax or they reduced the, the, yeah. uh, not the legislation on, on the laws pertaining to self-driving cars. So that's probably why they chose this place to go. Yeah. It's probably a bit easier for a state such as Arizona to do this instead of a state like New York to do it. It's not exactly as much of like a sprawling metropolis as other states. Yeah. I think we're getting a little bit of feedback from somebody, by the way. But yeah, it as well. But I am um, going through the article, like you were saying, like you're not sure what the law they have laws in place. It was a, uh, the, the governor signed an executive order that allows universities to test vehicles with no driver on board so long as a licensed driver has responsibility for the take control remotely if the vehicle needs assistance. So that's the official written law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that feedback is coming from you, Jeff. Um, this is a side note, but, but um, um, it's going to be exciting because this is way ahead of all the predictions for self-driving cars. A lot of people were predicting years, like five or six years, but if this really takes off, then it sets a precedent going forward for the self-driving car community. So I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes and where this industry takes place. And it's Google too, so you know they've got the data to back this up. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know much about Phoenix. Do we know? Is Phoenix pretty flat too? Because that would help. That would help. No hills. It's very like. <laughs> yeah, it's a, I wouldn't say it's. I, I don't know how, how mountainous it really is. It's hot, but, so maybe there's like less people driving. Yeah, people the weather's staying. the weather's are very much a constant, so they don't have to worry about snow or rain obscuring any of the roads, which is yeah. important to note because Perfect. I'm pretty sure that a self-driving. It's not like Philly. I'm pretty yeah, sure that it's. Self-driving car like Maniunk, it would it would break immediately. Like, yeah, it, would, it would lose track yeah. of the road and then go that's, into a building. That's, and that's the it. that's the real test. That yeah. will be the real test. If you can deploy a Waymo car in Philadelphia and successfully pull off a ride, then I'll you're be okay. then I'll you're be doing well. Yeah. Then yeah, then it. I'll be fine getting into one for sure. All those yeah. all those two-way streets that 
don't have enough room for one car, let alone two. <laughs> yeah. Not to mention, like, the long list of streets that have long since faded away all of their, like, road markings and, like, lane turns and stuff like that. And they're just kind oh, of, yeah. like, it's just kind of like a slab of concrete that's full of cracks. And it's, There's I want to see one. colored on the side for sidewalks. That's like, yeah. it's... <laughs> so, also known as Waymo, if you're trying to send a car to the East Coast, let us know and we can get you set up on some roads that'll actually yeah. test this. <laughs> we got, we got some of these roads, trust us. Yeah. Does anybody uh, else think this might be this since they're trying to announce it so quickly, it might be in a response to Tesla self-driving cars as well? Uh, I think so. Yeah. It could be a, a bit, bit related to that. But Tesla's not even at that talk about yeah, well, the actual sensors. The yeah. hardware is different, significantly different between Google and Tesla. It definitely mm -hmm. is. And also Tesla is not even near the point where it's ready to uh have the cars drive themselves without anyone in the driver's seat. So Tesla's right. way behind on that part. Um, maybe they're just cautious or just not waiting because it is real. So it's not really testing. So they're cautious on releasing that to actual cars. Although they have the hardware capability in the cars right now, they don't want to pretty much make their drivers guinea pigs. Um, <laughs> right. Um, I wouldn't want to be a guinea pig. Um, so, but um, Waymo, if wants to release this in a, on a small scale, just to test it right i'm sure there's going to be someone with a big red button uh sitting somewhere in the car where if it goes wrong they just press it and just all goes i i really hope that's the case uh, mm -hmm. but uh yeah i it, this self-driving car uh, thing is really heating up and, and a lot of people are getting into it um intel just bought uh, a big player in it um recently um and now we know we all know google's in it as well as uh, tesla has been working on it for quite a bit so um it's it's coming faster than most people think i uh i i assume um uh, but yeah looking forward yeah, so, to so seeing I, i'll be it'd be fun to just go to phoenix and, and try one of these out i'll be really really yeah. excited <laughs> cool. to do that chandler in particular according to the article is the suburb where they're going to be doing this first they've been extensively testing in this suburb road and trip apparently... what's that <laughs> road trip <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i for we'll a road, road the... trip <laughs> yeah take the, uh, the whole road trip though <laughs> we'll take yeah. the autopilot tesla to the self-driving yes. cars yes and then yeah I, I'm, I'm down for this <laughs> and um <laughs> also they the whole trip it looks like it's just going to be a bunch of minivans too. So that's another thing using Fiat Chrysler. They were trying to make a deal with Ford, but apparently that fell through last second. So they had to make a deal with Fiat Chrysler. So, but yeah, that, going off what we said earlier, Waymo chose the Phoenix area for its favorable weather, its wide, well-maintained streets, and the relative lack of pedestrians. So <laughs> The relative <laughs> lack of pedestrians. <laughs> so they're trying to minimize the collateral damage. Yeah, just, yeah, they ain't got no right. people. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Bring it Why wouldn't we go there? Yeah. Bring it to Philly yeah. with a full nor'easter going on. Then we'll see what you can do. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's the final test. Yeah. That's, that's it. Yeah. Uh, but it's so it, it's funny because like it, it seems like it's close, but they it, as you guys have read in the article, they've they're still facing some challenges. Their goal was to release a hundred vehicles, but only fifty have been in use so far. So mm -hmm. The other ones are dealing with technical difficulties, but those are undefined to the public at the moment. Um, one of the big issues is when the car uh, needs help, it, the delay in the people in the office reacting to that car. So a lot of times it'll hold up traffic uh, because they just don't have enough of a full workforce. So it'll be like one guy and he goes up to get a cup of coffee. He comes back and the car's been screaming like, yo, help me, please. I don't know what to do. Um, it's, it's having issues with uh, a lot of private properties, uh, cul-de-sacs um, and uh, like parking lots, stuff like that. So stuff that like, like you said, it's not really fully defined what the lane is, where the road is. So basically mm -hmm. every street in Philadelphia, um, <laughs> besides major ones, like every side street. I think, I think every street's an understatement. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so they said that basically they're, to avoid issues going forward, they basically need to train a lot of people to be ready to respond to these cars at all times. Mm -hmm. um, 
which I mean, I don't know how, what Google's success rate is with, with managing that many people at once, let alone a hundred cars with technical difficulties. So yeah. um, Wait, are they hiring these people to work from home? You get the little, uh, you know, the steering wheel on your desk and the, the gas pedals. <laughs> That'd be beautiful. Yeah. Remote. Like the, get like the, the old PS one, like lap. lap <laughs> remote oh man, dude. That'd be perfect. Bringing back memories now. <laughs> yeah. Cruising USA. Like the little... <laughs> but, um, I, I, I'm excited to see how this turns out because this is kind of like the first actual field test of self-driving technology and fully self-driving at that too, not just like autonomous or autopilot or whatever fancy word that a company wants to slap on their form of, it reads the cars near you. Like, I want this car to be able to get me from A to B and then go off and then take care of somebody else. And that's that. <laughs> um, but... Uh, I don't know if anybody has anything else to contribute to the article. We can always move on to our uh, last topic of the first half and then save all the discussion for the fun stuff coming up in the second half. But anybody have any closing points on this article here? No. Oh. All right. I got cool. Um, so we got some news on Kaspersky antivirus. Um, so the Russian government was apparently they lifted details about U.S. cyber capabilities from an NS from an NSA employee who was running Kaspersky on his desktop. So this is another example of um, using a highly and widely utilized public piece of software to take advantage of um, getting an exploit into a government building because a lot of people use this service. So it's more than likely someone is going to have Kaspersky antivirus or something. It's a, it's a well-trusted service. So embedding in some type of malware is almost to be expected. The same thing happened the week prior. I forget the software that happened with, that was CCleaner. That's what yep. it was. CCleaner. We discussed it last, uh, right, last yeah. episode, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was last week. I, the yeah. weeks fly by so fast. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was not a while yeah. ago either. It was just a couple of days ago. It was. It's um, like it was. It was almost like it was Sunday. Um, <laughs> but the um, it's they're not they're not commenting on the breach, um, so there's not much being disclosed on what exactly happened in terms of the risks in, involved. But um, the article goes on to say that the breach serves as a stark warning, not just to the federal government, but to states, local governments, and the American public of the dangers of using Kaspersky software. Um, who's a vocal critic of Kaspersky who's pushed for the software's ban in federal networks. And I, for one, I don't know how I feel about how, I don't know if, I, I don't know how I feel about government officials using enterprise software for this type of a situation like wouldn't don't you think that they would have the research and development to, to create their own form of antivirus or um, something that's a little bit more auditable and maintained by themselves internally like i feel like that would be the best course of action for a nation state would be to i mean even if it's in term help I, I don't know it might be too much to ask to have them it's like i oh, yeah, just make your own but Right. It I don't seems know. Like at that point, why not make your own operating system and your own right. browsers? And, you yeah. Know. And that's the government was using Blackberries for years, too. So, <laughs> yeah. True. yeah. Um, but I don't know what if anybody has any other thoughts on this. I'm just, we've, we're seeing these breaches coming out left and right from both government and corporate levels. And it's just a, a matter of like people need to be able to trust the software that they use. Because first it's CCleaner, now it's Kaspersky, and what happens after that, you know? Like, I, I'm trying to figure out, like, where where someone could go from this. Like, do they do they all pick up Norton <laughs> after uh, this? Probably they shouldn't, no. Uh, yeah, no, it's, that's a life Norton, lesson yeah. that we learned years ago. Norton is not the best choice. Um, yeah. But I think we need definitely some kind of... Um, I don't even know what you call it, some kind of audit in place where every piece of software that's being used by these organizations or in this government, in this case, government uh, entities, um, they go through a, a, a deep audit process before they get uh, accepted within right. the organization, something in place, 
uh, that keeps everything secure. I know it's a huge, probably a huge undertaking. Um, it's probably hard to control everything that's coming in in terms of uh, software uh, that they use internally. Uh, but I think it's the benefit for everyone. Mm -hmm. And it's also important to note that the article mentions that the company's founder, Eugene Kaspersky, graduated from a KGB-supported cryptography school. <laughs> and he had worked in Russian military intelligence. So, yeah. like, the writing was on the wall with this yeah, one Kaspersky here. Yeah, <laughs> Kaspersky is a, a wild card there. Um, he's, yeah. Uh, he's definitely a so, loose cannon, uh, for sure. So... So maybe they'll reevaluate and yeah. switch over to like semantic or like Avast or some other, <laughs> or just Windows Defender Actually, even. Yeah, Avast yeah. is not the best decision. You know why? No, I'm deliberately talking no, about I know. <laughs> terrible ones, but you can explain it if you'd like. The C, the they're related to. So they they bought the the people who developed C Cleaner, and so the C Cleaner is technically it's owned by an antivirus company called Avast. And they were attacked using a Trojan ho or a Trojan type of bug in a software that they own. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like the the antivirus company gets a virus. Like yes. How do you explain that? <laughs> uh, I'm going off of this article. I'm impressed that they were able to trace it back to Kaspersky because that must have been some extremely sensitive information if they brought it back to one NSA agent in particular's uh, computer. Mm -hmm. And then they were able to track it back to that um, antivirus software from there. Yeah. Which probably does mean they have a very finite control over their network mm -hmm. and they know right. what goes in and out right. of it. So control it's a good thing. That, yeah. yeah. They, they declined to comment on what the breach was. <laughs> yeah. Just wish it wasn't so reactive, you know? Like, yeah. Why? It's hard to be proactive because what is proactive when it comes to software? It's extremely hard to be proactive with this kind of stuff. But the only thing you can do is just kind of try to minimize the damage going forward. So, yeah. but with that on the table, um, I now we get to move is... on to the fun stuff. Yeah, I think that's the <laughs> yeah. end of the first half. We can uh, figure out where J Buds went and solve this mystery and have the gang <laughs> back together for the second half. Yeah, sounds good. Will we find him by the time the second half starts? Will he be a robot? Will he be a human? <laughs> Tune in next time on the second half of Industry 4.0. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll see you in the next half. Everybody, welcome back. It's episode 22 for Industry 4.0. Joined by my co-stars, Matt, Jeff, Ryan, and Irvin. As always, I'm Kyle. Before we get into the exciting second half, make sure, regardless of how you guys are checking us out now, you can find us on so many different mediums, so many different places we're at. You can find us on our main podcast hosting page, Podbean. Love you guys. Industry 4.0, all spelled out, dot podbean.com. You can also find us on traditional google play store you can find us on the itunes store if you just search industry 4.0 you can find us there always a good place to go and if you guys rate us on there now apparently we need more ratings for me to see all of the ratings which is a really weird concept but anyway if you guys rate us on there we'll give you a shout out we'll even give you some feedback if you find us on facebook and twitter and we'll bounce back uh, bounce back ideas off of you we love to hear from you guys basically we want to see Things you like, things you don't like. We do this show as much for you as we do it for us. So please keep listening. Like I said, you can check us out on Facebook and Twitter if you search uh, facebook.com slash industry 4 all spelled out. Same thing with Twitter. Um, and if you loved all the music that you heard, man, Jeff, we'll give him a big plug at the end. But my man, Jeff, on the podcast, supplied all the music you heard coming in and out. Um, well, let's get right to it, guys. I mean, the, the biggest thing that happened this week, we're recording this on Thursday, yesterday, Google's big event. I, I mean, I was so stoked. I was amped up. Mm -hmm. Slayton, tell, tell us your first thoughts. Tell us what you thought before we get into specific products. What was your feel? Because you worked at home yesterday just so you could live tweet from our active Twitter account. 
You live right. tweeted during the event. Tell us exactly what your takeaway was, and then let's jump right into what I, I feel like a lot of us were most excited about, the, uh, the Google Lens. So let me preface the event with saying that there was a lot of triggers of the Google Assistant throughout that whole event, and <laughs> it was the most difficult thing ever to actually have to listen to the conference and be able to um, still take care of the things I needed to take care of and keep up with, the, with, uh, with Twitter taking care of everything on that as well as like stopping all of my Google devices from triggering every single time a commercial played because <laughs> they like hadn't prepped them on the devices yet. So like I had to run upstairs and mute my Google home. I had to run down, like turn off the like the assistant on my Nvidia shield, but the event was very well done. It was um, the positioning of everything down to like where the cameras were directed at any given time was very well taken care of and, they had a huge family of products they announced. Um, among these, you have updates to their Google Home, their their smart home line, updates to the phone, which everybody expected. And we had covered earlier some leaks about it. And a lot of those were confirmed. And there were a few surprises that were throughout that. Um, there's some updates to their Chromebook line, their Daydream line, and then even a couple of like surprise products they announced towards the end. So I was overall very impressed with the direction that Google's heading. And it's a little bit more of a premium experience than most people are willing to buy into. But um, when you look at their competition, Apple and um, other companies like uh, like the Huawei and other stuff like that who have more, and Samsung who have high-end smartphones, you can kind of understand where they're coming from. But uh, to, to jump in, to kind of go to follow the order of the, the keynote almost, um, well, I don't know, should we cover the Pixel or should we go straight in as the order of the keynote? I wanna see what you guys think. Um, Cause I'm kind of thinking we follow in the order of the keynote. Yeah, let's go with that. Yeah, okay, okay. we'll switch it out, that's fine. Right, right. Um, so the first product that they had announced was their competition to the Amazon Echo Dot, the Google Home Mini. So um, I don't know how many of the other people besides Irvin have those cheaper end smart home devices around your house. But I'm curious to hear your thoughts on their entry into this competition with Amazon for kind of a cheap hockey puck shaped Google assistant. Um, see what your thoughts are on the design, on the product itself. Um, you guys saw my thoughts on, on Twitter as I went through it, but. For anyone listening now who didn't see, you can check us out on Twitter and get all those uh, recap notes from Matt here, who is, uh, talking about everything that was going on um i like i like the way it looks i think it's it's it blends in mm -hmm. seems pretty there's a couple different options they have a black and gray and a red from what i coral coral not red sorry i, I missed <laughs> <Forgive me. laughs> cool. uh... um, I, I like how this looks a lot better than what i saw from amazon in last week's episode i think that's a lot less tacky and that uh gonna blend in a lot more with the environment that's already set up in a lot of uh, residences of people who may. Yeah. Right. It, they make, they make that, they made that choice with the Google original Google home as well to make it more aesthetically pleasing, not just a gadget in your living room or your kitchen or wherever, wherever you decide to put it, put it, but something that blends in with the decor that you already have. So they launch these uh, in, interchangeable bases to change the color of them and here they match the same type of look with the mini. Um, this is a great entry price too at 50. It's not as cheap as the uh, Echo Dot, but according to Google, it does have a, a better speaker than the Echo Dot. We'll just have mm -hmm. to wait and see if that actually is true and if it's worth that extra price tag that they put on uh, for $50. Um, but it is an easier way to enter this smart home uh uh, field if you want to jump in on the Google Home ecosystem uh, because it does exactly the same stuff as the big Google Home does. Um, there's no difference in whatsoever so in the capability. That's going to be my question. So there's yeah. no there's no la no less features in the no, in the dot nothing. than the than the big nothing. home. Yeah, no, or the, no the dot, excuse me, the mini. Yeah, there's yeah, no. You've got the full assistant, full full everything. You can control uh, all the smart devices. 
ask the same exact commands that you do with the big one absolutely no difference just just the size difference um, the and only the cost yeah yeah the, the only downside between this and the full google home is the ability to just have a more powerful speaker the google home has a substantially louder speaker from what yeah from what they were from what it seemed like they were talking about and I'll be able to confirm this in the coming month or so when I receive my Google Home Mini because I may or may not have ordered one during the conference. <laughs> <laughs> so, we can um, compare to the, yeah, we to can the, do a comparison to the Google the Home. Yeah, I've got one sitting on the other side of my room for controlling lights, and um, and I had a I have a Home and I have an Echo Dot, and overall the experience I've had with the Google devices have been in at least in my use case more pleasant and I've gotten better responses from the home itself in terms of functionality and being able to get me what I want and how it plays with my Google calendar and all of my um, stuff because I'm totally bought into the Google ecosystem so yeah. it may be a bit biased coming from me <laughs> but <laughs> it's a, talk to you for a couple minutes you'll realize that but yeah but um it's a it's an awesome device and i think this is this was kind of like the move that everybody hoped they would make like a lot of people were like waiting for something that google would do to officially say that yes that we are in full competition with both amazon and apple which we'll get into in a little bit but um seeing the echo dot come out and seeing amazon discount that people were just it was a matter of time until google did this this and isn't i mean to comment back on the what we were saying about this the quality of the speakers this isn't meant to be like a a soundbar you know yeah. it it's more meant for a little device where you can shout out and ask for some tips through the day yeah. i am right. curious about this this for anyone who's looking at the page or anyone who's checked this out already tackle your day get personalized help with your schedule reminders calls news and more um, I'm wondering if this device can tell me when to get out of bed so I won't be late and look like a bum. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a me problem. But you can configure alarms on the devices. I'd yeah. love for it to be like, hey, you said you're gonna be at, you know, where you need to be at 9 a.m. Uh, you should probably get out of bed now. <laughs> yeah, that would be I've, good. Set an alarm that I repeatedly snooze. <laughs> yeah, it's like you've snoozed this alarm 20 times. So something that was also announced relating to the Google Home, but that wasn't, re I don't remember any leaks about it. No, this it was, one wasn't the, leaked. I was the, like this, digging through yeah. the, the, like the releases. This and was the a leaks surprise to, to me. So at the, un so now they released a cheaper Google Home and now on the other side of the spectrum, the Google Home Max was also announced. And this looks like to be a direct competitor to uh, Apple's HomePod. It, it's going for the higher end market. Uh, with the price of three ninety nine, um, mm -hmm. and it's supposed to offer amazing sound for uh, that price. Uh, really deep bass, uh, really loud. From all the people who I see in videos from who've actually seen it uh, or listened to it, uh, is more accurate in person. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really interested in seeing and perhaps hearing it in a store or in in a best buy somewhere to see act the actual quality but um, this was this took me by surprise but this is the direct competition with the home pod because they right. the home pod was touting all these all these smart features where it'll uh, figure out what type of room that it's in and automatically adjust the sound uh to that room and this google home max offers the same type of features uh according to google uh, where it'll figure out it listens to itself as it's playing music and it adjusts the sound to make it sound the best for the environment that it's located in. So I'm very interested in this. It is a high price tag. I don't know why you, you guys are thought you, your guys' thoughts on uh, something on this uh, range. Um, but if you wanted to invest some something like high quality uh, speakers that can play a plethora of uh, online streaming services, not just Apple Music, like the HomePod is currently locked to, because uh, according to Apple, they haven't neither confirmed or denied that they're going to allow any other streaming services. Right now, it's only Apple Music. But with this, you can mm -hmm. stream Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google's own Play Music, uh, YouTube uh, Music, and all that. It, they keep it very open. If you want something in your living room that's really high quality and you're willing to 
pay that price and they even talked about hooking up uh, your record player up to this to listen to that full uh, uh, quality of music from from the records that you might have um, this seems like a, a really good device one thing uh, you can go for it Oh, sorry, man. Um, I, I, I'm just looking at this and I'm thinking, wow, this would be perfect to put like downstairs in a little home gym area. I wouldn't want to put it in my family room because I'll probably have a better sound system up there than a $400 one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but then again, saying that it, the $400 price point for this, I'd like to see a little lower, like $250, $300, something mm -hmm. like that. Four is kind of steep. Right. Also, um, the one thing that they didn't really talk too much to or any of the reviewers that I saw talk much to, the the one thing to note between this device and all of the other Google Home family devices is that the Google Home Max is the only one that has a 3.5 millimeter jack mm -hmm. for audio input yeah. nice. or for audio. So that means you could theoretically feed in an analog audio source yeah. and get fantastic audio output mm -hmm. through the home or through, I don't know, I don't know if it works both ways. I don't, haven't seen any confirmation on if you could daisy chain it to another speaker um it might just be an input mm -hmm. but that is an yeah, important thing yeah. to note because yeah. for any of the other devices in order to connect them to another speaker you need a chromecast audio mm -hmm. so that's another device which is a 35 dollar adapter which plugs into the audio jack of another speaker but and um, if, and if you buy two of these you can pair them up for left and right channels <laughs> yeah just replace which my desk fun. speakers with yeah. them <laughs> i'm I'm psyched for this one. I, I think, I used to, I, I think I commented on this when we were talking about Amazon and like they kind of hit the mark. Back in the day, I used to daydream, walk into a room and just shout out like, uh, play this Pandora station. And now you can walk in a room and say, hey, turn on this Spotify station and put the volume at this level. And it automatically adjusts to how it should sound in mm -hmm. the environment you're in. That's, this is this, the future is now, boys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is. I I saw a video of someone who was actually um, listening to it, um, and they said they had a Google engineer who was showing them all, showing it off to them, and it was playing the music at full blast, right? Full blast, yeah. and the Google engineer just like sort of just mumbled, "Okay, you know who, right?" And it name a famous search engine. <laughs> <laughs> and it still heard it, even though the speaker was blasting the music at full volume. And it was, they didn't need to yell. They didn't need to uh, just get, like, go up close to it. They just, like, casually said that uh, trigger word, and it activated and it started listening for that command. And that, if that's true from what was said during that uh, review video in The Verge, uh, that would be really impressive. Um, right, completely that's one of the biggest issues that I have with uh, the the echo that we currently have in my home. It's it's it, <laughs> if we need it to turn down, we have to like yell at it to turn down. <laughs> like, yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. Same thing even with the home. If it's playing music, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to get it to stop playing music. <laughs> I have to like scream across the room at it. Mm -hmm. But um, another thing that we haven't really touched on with this that I wanted to touch on before we moved on to the next topic is the AI behind the hardware in this so in the same demo the google tech moved the speaker from the open space that it was in into a corner of the room so the acoustics were very different in the location that it was in and they said for about five to ten seconds the speaker sounded like really blown out and tingy and really weird and then after that the audio completely adjusted and the acoustics sounded fantastic that's from awesome the corner of the room so it will adjust to play the audio at the best tone given whatever environment you toss it in so that's really sick like that's that's mm -hmm. such an underrated feature yeah. i feel like like that's if, right yeah i can't oh, wait to that's... actually listen to it, this person and if it really does sound like that it could be like a really quality speaker that you can buy in your living room uh, and put it like as a center like piece for like a house party or something um and, and really fill a room with, with sound and high quality sound at that. So I, I'm mm -hmm. very, very curious about these and if they actually live up to the hype uh, that Google put on that. This is yeah. fun. Yeah. For me, the big sell is the, 
the amount of partners they have in terms of music service providers. I mean, yeah. you're not limited to iTunes like Apple right. is. Like you yeah. got you got Google Play, you got Pandora, you got Spotify. They, you can go across your music selection here. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping for four hundred dollars, they can be the equivalent of studio monitors because that's yeah. the price range they're aiming for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for the expensive speaker that I have in my house to die, so that way I have a reason to get this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know i know a guy. For a price that can be arranged yes yeah. yes kyle kyle knows a guy who knows a guy <laughs> um, no guy specializes in breaking speakers so you can buy more speakers <laughs> he's really good at it yeah. <laughs> just, he and everything goes just get everything else out that you want yeah <laughs> um but the to kind of segue in because the the assistant the ai behind this was the driving force for the entire family of products they announced in this as they were to quote at the made by google uh conference so the the next step from that was to update their pixel book line and that was um that was a market that they hadn't touched in, I think, two or three years, Urban, from the I last time they made a Chromebook so, Pixel. Yeah. yeah. And this Chromebook Pixel, um, albeit the price is a little bit steep for a Chromebook, but the hardware and the the specs you get behind this product are seriously nice. And even with the leaks and what we knew going into this conference, I was still very impressed. And... The one thing I did notice was I'm pretty sure the leaks had under, had overestimated the price by about two hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. I think the yeah. eleven hundred was the base in the yeah. leaks, and people can feel free to go back to that episode and fact check us on that one. But um, there, the, the base model for the Pixelbook is nine hundred and ninety nine dollars, with a one hundred dollar Google Pen. So, it's got a lot of stuff going for it. Um, this as we had talked about, is definitely aimed more at the creative type. So it's aimed more at people who are going to use this for like a, a creative type situation where you're drafting photos in Lightroom or you're making edits to stuff or you're, you're actually doing drawing. And the Google Pen is touted as the fastest um, stylus style pen out there with a 10 millisecond delay, which is the fastest current um, I, I, you can almost like put it in the same field as like Wacom or the iPad Pro where it's faster than the competition that's currently out there. So, yeah. um, and on top of that, it's got some nice hardware and software specs and perks to go with that. Like it's got a dedicated Google Assistant button. And um, I don't know if you guys had seen this, but when you trigger the Google Assistant, you can do a couple of things, depending on if you have the pen or not. There's a dedicated button where the Windows key would be on most desktops, and that's just the assistant. And you can do the same thing, and if you draw a circle on the screen with the pen, the assistant will take everything inside that circle and try to like gauge what you're trying to get it to do and that draw context from that. That blows my mind. I think that is the coolest thing ever. It takes Google searching and just takes it to an entirely new level. Yeah, like you just yeah. circle a phone number and then it just searches yeah, not, for it. Right, or it creates a contact or whatever. Mm. Like what about a keyword if you want to research a topic and it just brings it up for you? It's just that much easier. Yeah. Right. It's just like... Back it's, in the day, that you, yeah, you would type in a keyword into a search engine and be like, oh, a couple clicks away and now I get to an article that's like it's an amazing wealth of information. Now you're reading an article on the fly. If you're... I don't know when I read scientific articles or something like there's maybe a topic that I'm, I'm not extremely familiar with. I want to brush up on, I'll go to Wikipedia or whatever, you know, pages I can find on my search engine and brush up on that topic and better understand the article. Now you can just circle it while you're going mm -hmm. about it and then proceed. This is that next step and just make information that much more accessible. Yeah, and even if you don't circle and you trigger the assistant, it'll still attempt to draw context from the screen, which no other Chromebook does at this time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, a lot of the initial tech reviewers, some of the bigger, um, more famous tech channels on YouTube who do the reviews were noting that this was also one of the first Chromebooks where the Android experience uh, was much more smooth on the Chromebooks. So the thing that Chromebooks have that other laptops don't is they can run full 
Android applications in an emulated screen, like a box, on, like a window for your computer. And it's a full Android app from the Play Store. And they were touting that it's it's much more smooth because it's backed up by a lot more powerful hardware mm -hmm. on top of like they announced a couple of them like one of them was you can have snapchat like they're developing an app specifically for the chromebook pixel um, or the pixel book i'm sorry the chrome the pixel book uh but um, and that's I'm, how you get like actual work done on these chromebooks because previously chromebooks right. only had the chrome browser and now recently google started to launch uh, or add uh, these uh, Google apps that you the full Play Store. So just like on your Android phone, you can access the full Play Store. So that's when M Matt mentioned you can do your full Lightroom editing and uh, creating documents. It's all through those uh, the same Lightroom app that you use on your phone is the same one running on this Pixelbook. So we have the same editing features, the same type of controls. Um, and if Adobe works on uh, optimizing that screen or optimizing for this screen size, which they said they would uh, for not just for this Pixel books in particular, but Chromebooks overall, they're working on optimizing the interfaces for all the Adobe Android apps that are currently out there. Um, right. This, this might be a viable product for someone who doesn't want to use a Mac or Windows PC. I don't know how many of those people are who are one of those who are creative types like perhaps Ryan or myself <laughs> that might want to work on stuff like that. Um, I don't know. Um, I feel like this is targeted like we were talking about a week or two ago at the creatives. And now that I'm seeing with the support of the assistant and the full suite of Android applications that come supported with it, I can see this very easily also being targeted towards students who, yep. when they're going into college, don't, they need they need something that offers them a full fledged experience with solid hardware to back it up, but and they and, don't yeah. need like a MacBook or yeah. a Windows computer to do it. And Chromebooks are huge in schools. So let's say mm -hmm. someone started out using a Chromebook in middle school and then perhaps in high school, they're going to college. What are they going to look at? They're familiar with the Chromebooks. They use it all throughout their school life, right? They're going to be like, oh, right. I'm already familiar with that. I don't know about this Windows, right? I'm not really used to it because Chromebooks are really taking over the, the K through 12 market. Like, it's ridiculous. A lot of right. schools are, are adopting these Chromebooks to be used in schools. And now that those kids are, are turning into that college age, they're look, starting to look at laptops for, for use in school. This might be something big for uh, something that they really might consider. Um, mm -hmm. for actually using in a college setting. That's and Google's yeah. scouting those top prospects of the creative <laughs> types. <They're laughs> they are. They're, yeah, they're trying yeah. to take people who are familiar with the Chromebook experience but would be interested in like an yeah. iPad or a Wacom they're, tablet. They're building that next generation of creative types through their own products, basically. I mean, it's right. like you said, if, if they're basically taking the resources that they have already and trying, hoping to build on that for future generations, not necessarily to steal from the current generation. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the hardware specs on this as an avid Adobe user, and I think it hits everything on the mark with the 16 gigabytes of RAM, the processor. But I look at the screen, and it's 2.5K, and I'm like, ah, it's pretty, it's good, but it's not, it's not, it's not like a UHD. It's not like 3840 or anything. Yeah. It's not close to 4K. It's still 2.5. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still usable as long as I get the color range. But then I look over here, it says 72%. NTSC color, which is the equivalent of 100% sRGB. So you got 100% of your standard red screens, blues, but there's also an Adobe color range that was added in 98. And the Adobe color range covers the, uh, was it CYMK? So you got your yeah. cyans, your yellows, your magentas. Um, yeah. So, this one? yeah. Sorry. so it might not be the most color accurate monitor yeah. for sure. Right, but, it, but if you're it, it, aiming at creative types, you have to focus on your yeah. screen. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. That's got to be the first step, mm -hmm. honestly. Yeah. Yeah. You, you have to have the best screen possible to get all the vivid colors. Yeah, one, inter to me, yeah, one, in one interesting thing about the tech is specs that you're going over. It's running, there are two options. You can get a Core i7 or a Core i5. Um, and the interesting part is that all of these, no matter which processor that you pick, it's fanless, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. There's no fans yeah. in this whatsoever. 
Uh, I know that the Surface Book did sort of this in the latest, their latest model. I think the i5 is the one that doesn't have a fan, but in the i7, they needed to put a fan because they needed to cool down the i7. But in this one, they figure out for the i7 a way to cool it without a fan, which is uh, fairly that's, amazing. That is that's, impressive. Yeah. That's technology that us mortals don't have yet. <laughs> <laughs> the ability to cool down an i7 without a fan. Yeah. Anybody says, who has says, a computer and checks the thermals of an i7 knows what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. That says an i5 or an i7, so I guess you get the option. Yeah. Yeah, you can upgrade for the Steam 4K on... output to a 4K monitor. Right. Yeah. yeah. The um, you the base model of this comes with the i5, eight gigabytes of RAM, and the 128 gigabyte SSD, and then you can upgrade to the 256 SSD for another 200 and then for an additional 650 off the base price you get the maxed out one you get the i7 with 16 gigs and 512 gigabytes of nvme ssd memory so it's you can't kind of like mix and match you can't get an i5 with 16 you have to get you have to go all in if you want that extra ram yeah plus that 100 bucks for that uh pen if you want that yeah and the other thing that's important to note is the um, the two base models with the i5 are available right now mm-hmm. to uh, pre-order, which ship in four to five weeks, um, or like three to four weeks, depending on which one. And the i7 is not ready yet, so it says it says coming soon. So it's basically like joining a wait list at this time. So that's an oh. important. Anyone Will looking? Be a fan? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it actually just comes with a giant Dyson fan. Right. <laughs> but it's a it's a serious improvement for like I'm not as disappointed with the massive cost now that I know everything that they're putting into this hardware and it looks great too. So, oh, I'm definitely impressed. Yeah, I'm big step impressed. up for them for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, but now, um, with the conference came. The piece de resistance, or like the, the like the thing everyone came for, which was the Pixel Two. Um, I know we have some people in this podcast in particular who are hype about the Pixel Two. Um, who? But who? <laughs> someone who may have pre-ordered one. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I'm definitely excited to get my hands on this and to try it and to see how this phone holds up yeah. against the other smartphones that have been released. Yeah, so pretty much and, all the leaks... And to review it right here on Industry yeah. 4.0. Yeah. 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 Pretty much all the <laughs> leaks that we talked about a uh, couple episodes ago uh, turned, out to, to, turned out to be true. There are some surprises um, mm-hmm. in there uh, that we didn't know at the time of the leaks. Uh, the prices were right, so the starting price is 649 for the regular pixel 2 and then for the pixel 2 xl uh do what is it it goes all the way up it starts at uh i think it starts at 650 and then works its way up to 800 and 800 950 is the top of the line yeah. is the top of the line pixel 2 xl uh the main difference in terms of outside uh for these pixel 2 and pixel 2 xl is the screen um, so mm-hmm. the pixel regular pixel two has those top and bottom, uh, chins that most people are used to now for, uh, these, uh, phones. And then the pixel two XL now offers a, uh, fairly big, uh, screen to body ratio. Now it's similar to the, uh, LG V30, uh, cause of course it's made by LG. It's apparently using the same screen as the V30. Um, I would argue that the shell more resembles the G6 mm-hmm. than the V30, just because of the yeah. thickness of the bezels mm-hmm. for what it is. Um, but yeah, the spec wise, it does match the V30 yeah. in terms of the screen itself. Yeah. One thing um, that these phones have is dual front facing speakers, which I know Matt is a huge fan of for in phones in general. Uh, and yeah. This brings it back. I know the last phone that, that had this in terms of the pick uh nexus line was what the 6p the 6p yep. had this uh, yep. and then, then they removed it they... with the regular pixel and now they brought yep. it back 
lame bottom firing speaker, <laughs> which is nice, but it's no yeah. it's no dual front facing. Yeah, dual front facing. Um, but that's pretty much all about it in terms of outside, uh, in terms what you will see on the internals. Everything is everything else is exactly the same. Same camera hardware, same software, same processor on the inside. So no matter which of these that you decide to pick up, I think you're gonna have a really great experience. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that they really touted was the camera performance. Um, they introduced a uh, portrait mode just like every other manufacturer has uh starting with the iphone uh, apple made that one famous with the iphone 7 mm -hmm. and this one the pixel 2 also has this feature but the one unique thing about this one is that they figured out a way to do it uh, without having two cameras so both of these phones just have one camera they don't need a dual camera system to create these um portrait uh, pictures like the other manufacturers like Apple or Samsung are doing currently. Uh, yeah. So I'm very interested in to see how that software is able to figure out uh, what, what part of the image should they blur, what part they shouldn't. They're using apparently AI to do all that, all that local processing directly on the phone. Um, now, what blew me away with the camera announcement was, and I'll preface this by saying that before the original Pixel's release, I could not care less about what a DxO mark was at all, because I just didn't really know what kind of a metric that was. But <laughs> um, for a frame of reference, the original Pixel scored an 89 on the DxO mark, which was the highest it had ever, highest uh, DxO mark on any phone at the time. And then iOS came, or Apple released the iPhone 8 after that, which had a DxO mark of 94, which was a much higher score. And they touted that as being something that they achieved, and it's the highest one at that time. And then Google, not three weeks later, or not even a month later, comes out with their phone. And they're like, oh, yeah, the Pixel 2, it's just, you know, it's got a DxO mark of 98. That's fine. Like... The, the comparison in upgrade, like a phone announced a month after another phone, like it's as if they took a 2018 phone and brought it back from the future. And were like, <laughs> yeah, here's this new camera. Mm -hmm. And they did it with one, not dual cameras. They did yeah. it with one camera. Mm -hmm. Like that's incredible. And yeah. this camera technology, I, I know Thompson and I are fairly familiar with this because Canon uses this technology for their autofocus system, the dual pixel. Uh, autofocus yeah. system so Canon uses that type of technology so for really fast autofocus and they put that type of technology right directly into a smartphone camera which is pretty amazing so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really interested to see the performance on the autofocus um, and they said that they they're using this the dual pixel uh, technology to also do the portrait mode because instead of it's still only 12 megapixel, but for each pixel, there's technically a left and right side. So they can, in software, kind of do the portrait type of effect with the left and the right as it does with a dual, dual lens system, but without having two lenses, um, which is interesting. Yeah, and the fact that you can get a phone with a, with a camera that beats the eight plus on a smaller body is, is it just it just blows me away. And no. the uh, the AI on this phone powered through Google Lens and through the AR core that Google's working on. I know they had a demo on stage where they did the AR stickers where you could um, kind of like with Snapchat how you could drop down the little hot dog guy into like the room and have him sitting there. You can do the same thing, but with like various characters and like animations from like the, the example they showed on stage was Stranger Things where they dropped down like the monster and they dropped down 11 and like they interacted with each other on the ground and you could like move around and like look away from it, look back. And it's, it's impressive to see how powerful this thing actually is. And while Google is not exactly known for making the prettiest smartphones, they're definitely known for making the one with the greatest AI backing and mm -hmm. 
some of the best hard, like software specs to back up the hardware that they're providing. So, and from my recent experience in using <coughs> pixel phones as well as you, Matt, that software and hardware experience together, it's like we've we we both between the both of us, I don't even know how many different phones we've used, Android phones <laughs> in particular, but. This is in, in terms of Pixel is like my favorite Android experience that I've ever had using a phone and I've had mm -hmm. the latest and greatest Galaxy S8 and it wasn't anywhere near close to the smoothness, the reliability of an operating system of a phone as it is on this Pixel that I have right now. Yeah, the, just the, original, the original Pixel. The original one, not even this brand new one. Yeah. Um, so there's a there's a reason they're still comparing the original Pixel to phones released today. Yeah. It's because it stands up and it might it look, may not. Yeah, it might look boring on paper or just like any other flagship, but comparing them side by side with the same type of flagship device from Samsung or LG, just the software experience alone is what differentiates the Pixel line. Um, mm -hmm. as well as the camera for performance because they have been top-notch ever since the first one and now they're continuing that uh, gain any what anyone else have any other thoughts i know it's just been me and pretty much matt <laughs> nerding out been, over these uh, phones but i've been letting oh, you guys go but i i am excited to at some point compare pixel to, to pixel right yes. like, yeah just to kind of like see what you know what kind of changes we really see from yeah I'm, point and like an operability standpoint like how different are they mm -hmm. i want to test the new gesture that the pixel 2 has where um you can instead of holding down the home button for the assistant you can squeeze the phone to trigger the assistant I'm excited. yeah yeah i want to try that because apparently google during the announcement was saying that there's they've spent um a long time researching and training their AI to differentiate between an in as what they called an intentional squeeze versus like an accidental squeeze. <laughs> so they're like, they're kind of working on making sure that like, if you, let's say like, cause when I run, I'd be interested in trying this because when I go for runs, I don't have an armband. So I hold my phone in my hand while I run. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to see if it would trigger the assistant. Yeah. It's, it reminds me of um, an uh, ex coworker of ours has a Steam controller for his TV, like he's a Steam box. Mm -hmm. And I remember him boasting for like, it felt like hours one night about how he could squeeze the side of his controller and <laughs> do things that we had to press buttons for. I, I think it's cool to see this come to a smartphone. It is going to be interesting in the aspect you're talking about because I. I'm constantly like a one hand grip the phone kind of guy. I feel like inadvertent squeezes could happen constantly. Mm -hmm. I don't think I want to assign that gesture to maybe posting a status to Facebook based on what yeah. I'm saying at the time or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> you, can but, also, uh, you can adjust the intensity is, so you can say, yeah. okay, how hard you have to actually squeeze it. Right. How intentional of a squeeze is it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Will it recognize when it's in my pocket if my pants are too tight? Is that going to be a squeeze? I don't know. It's like, yeah, yeah. And, and they say it works in a case too. Easy. Oh, man. So um, before before we move on, I actually wanted to ask the whole group a question, and then if anybody if anybody besides Matt has an answer, I would prefer Matt to go last. <laughs> since I know that I'll hold up. I'll hold hey, up. That's leaving. Um, <laughs> only because only because we know that you intend on getting the phone anyway. So. And try and put your 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 fanboyness aside for this one. But in, in general, from everything you heard about the Pixel Two, what is if you had to pick one? What is the one feature you, where you were like, "This is the reason to get the phone"? I made it. Why don't you, oh. Irvin or Jeff or Ryan? One of you guys jump in before Matt. Someone has a short-winded answer. Go ahead, because I don't. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll go. Stock Android and the camera. Mm -hmm. Done. <laughs> the, the camera for me was big too. When I saw what it could do, I was like, wow, like that's camera's important to me in a phone because I mean, mm -hmm. as I've been bugging you nonstop about getting an actual 
like a nice <laughs> professional camera. Um, I, I enjoy taking pictures. I'm just not as good as you guys. So that's all. But uh, <laughs> so that was the big thing for me. That was going to be my answer as well as the camera. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the same for me. I, the camera was pretty big uh, in terms of what is like, oh, wow, that's that's impressive uh, for the for just having just one camera. I think the one feature we didn't talk about is actually has optical image stabilization this time, not just right. uh, uh, electronic stabilization, uh, which the original Pixel had. And when you're taking video, uh, that really impressed me. When you're taking video, it does a combination of both electronic image stabilization and optical image stabilization to make the video look like it's on an actual gimbal which was really really impressive um hey urban i don't i don't have the specs up in front of me but do you know what frame rate those videos can hit at certain resolutions so i don't i don't think it's as high as the new iphones which can shoot 4k at 60 they didn't go into specifics well i'm assuming it's 4k at 30 and uh 1080p at 60 um they didn't talk about anything improvements on the super high speed um they didn't go into detail so i don't know uh, 1080 at 120 hopefully <laughs> one that be that'd be pretty sick 1080 like and 120 yeah, yeah. um they didn't that'd go into nice. details though about that but yeah that'd be so that's what caught really my attention um mm -hmm. when they were announcing these phones so jeff yeah, so um, if, if it hasn't been made explicitly clear to the listeners and viewers, my, my intention here is to get a Pixel 2 and move away from the iPhone. I know I mentioned that a um, long time ago. It feels like probably months at this point. We're getting to them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the, the last right. holdout. <laughs> I was waiting for the right device and the right time. The right time. And I've already gotten some bite back from some iPhone fans when I've disclosed this information. But um, honestly, I mean, I don't know what you had queued up next, really. But I, I mean, it's a mixture of the services available with this phone. I mean, the hardware in general is just very impressive to me. I, I, mm -hmm. And honestly, I really wanted, I, I pre-ordered the Pixel Buds. I don't know when they're coming up in conversation, but I pre-ordered them. Yeah. I love the, what? what feature we're surely going to highlight on those with translation. And um, I really just want to see what it can do. I want to do a review for this podcast and I did for what Google's bringing to the table. Right. All right, and Slavin, before we start, and that, I think we should go into the buds next since Jeff mentioned yeah, it. Definitely. Pick, just try, and, try your best to pick one thing for us. <laughs> just, just one. Just try and focus on one. <laughs> um. <laughs> okay so <laughs> if i had to pick one i would have to say the assistant just because ai is the center of google's future and it's going to be the driving force behind all of the features of that phone it's all going to be backed by ai so you're only going to see the phone improve over time That's so good answer I think that is the most important thing. And that was what they were highlighting the most in the conference and what they had talked about. They wanted to get that point across for their family moving forward. But um, I legit thought you were going to say something on the lines of like, you know, I think the assistant is the most important part. And I love the way that it really interacts with the camera because the camera does this and the way that that interacts. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was trying to keep it like actually an answer. And actually upload. <laughs> Google, which can perform. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to keep it important, but um, the to, to wrap it up though, the one thing that I noted that Urban pointed out to me was that they're going to support this phone for three years for software mm. updates. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. And so previously, two? so for Nexus and the previous Pixel device, the Google's policy was to support uh, the phones with two years of major. Uh, software updates, Android ma major Android software updates, so that be big releases. So moving from Lollipop to Oreo to Nougat, all that. Um, that though that wasn't the right order, I know, but <laughs> but uh, and then for three years, um, including that those initial two years for additional year, you're gonna get uh, security updates. 
Um, mm-hmm. But now, with the, starting with this Pixel 2 device, and that includes the Pixel XL, they're going to both do major software updates as well as security mm-hmm. updates for th- full three years. And I think the main reason for that is now Oreo, it, pro, uh, Project, pro- Treble. Project Treble, has made it so much better in terms of updating that, uh, updating the processor, um, getting all the manufacturers involved in the upgrade, making it easier for them, making all the hardware manufacturers to write drivers for the operating system so they can support these devices longer, uh, which mm-hmm. I think overall is a really good news for the future of the platform. I don't, it won't affect a lot of phones now, uh, but in the going forward, it'll have a huge impact on, on the phones that are mm-hmm. coming out for, especially those lower end markets where they might not have the capability to update them uh, as fast because right now it's too much of a hassle, but since Oreo is making it so much easier for manufacturers uh, to make updates to these phones that they're going to be more inclined to do so. Um, so it's, right. it's good news all around in terms of yeah. software updates. But aside from that, the Pixel, the whole shtick of it from Google from day one has always been it's Android as Google intended. Yeah. So that's that's all that's the best way that you can sell that phone in any way in any one non verbose way. It's it's a phone it's the it's the one of the few Android phones that just works out of the box. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like me and Irvin were saying, we've been struggling to slow down our pixels. Like it's, yeah. <laughs> it's tough to like get it to actually struggle on something. And most times it's the app's fault and not the phone's fault. Mm-hmm. But um, moving on, I know um, we could go on about the, the, the earbuds that Google made, but I want to cover just quickly this new uh, camera. And I wasn't as attentive during this part of the conference as I was the others, mostly because I was pre-ordering stuff in the store, which had just <laughs> opened. But um, <laughs> But the... The Google Clips, this um, little tiny um, non, which is one thing I thought was good, non-internet connected smart camera, which can take like short video clips and you can put anywhere around the house. Yeah. Um, that came out. I know you know a little bit more about it than and you've probably watched a little more on it than I have. But yeah, so wanna... this this came out. I didn't. I wasn't expecting this. So there's been a, there's been a sort of movement of like these cameras where you just attach it to yourself and it starts capturing um, your moments and it puts into like a time-lapse mode or you can share with your friends of like things that happen throughout the day. And I, when I first saw this, I thought that's where Google was going, but it turns out not really because according to some of the articles that I read, Google actually tried that use case where you can clip it onto a shirt and wear it throughout the day and, and it takes pictures, but it really didn't work out like that. So like the, it's very interesting. So the the market that they're going for is capturing big moments in your life. So let's say you're having a kid's birthday party, right? Um, things are happening, a lot of movement. They're doing funny stuff. You want to capture the moment, right? Um, so the idea of this Google Clips camera is you just attach it in a room pretty close to where the action is happening. And the AI on board figures out what parts of the image of to capture and when and then you re- can you review those the on your phone and save the ones that you like discard the ones you don't like but it takes the idea is to take the the hassle out of trying to capture the moment and let just let this device do all that and the way that it does is through artificial intelligence to see okay if the people are smiling in the photo or if they're i don't know like some kind of algorithm to figure out oh hey what's happening here and it's like like uh matt mentioned it's all happening offline it doesn't need to be connected to anything it all which is happens. great for security so you don't have to worry yeah. about people spying on your kids if you yeah. leave this in like a playroom or something so you can just it all all the processing that smart stuff happens directly on the device Mm-hmm. Um, and it has a fairly wide 130 degree camera, so it can pretty much capture a lot of the scene and just focus in on the part that might be an action part happening. So that you can they focus focus on our face where they're smiling. Um, it's very interesting. 
I don't know how well it will actually take off. It'd be very interesting to see in, in people's hands and what they think of it. But mm -hmm. this, this yeah. came out of left field for me. I wasn't expecting something like this. Your description right there piqued my interest. I mean, that's, that is really, in a, if it works the way it's supposed to, it's really, really impressive. Like that's mm -hmm. just, it, it's, it's something that's always aware. Like it's, it's always paying attention, but like you said, you don't have to, you don't have the worry of other people also paying attention through it. Like that's, it's like your own it's little really, photographer. really awesome. Yeah. yeah. Right. And I, I definitely this, see where Google is going like with these. I think we're going to see a lot more of these in the future, better, better quality, of course, in terms of camera, but they're right. definitely as the owners of YouTube have seen how important vlogging has become in the last few years. I think this is mm -hmm. the next step. Everybody right. wants to put their lives like they have. They want to edit it so it's just right. They can put themselves out there online, little pieces of their life that they think are important, so other people can see that. Mm -hmm. and, and this, yeah, this this ties in also with Google expanding a lot into the family situation. Um, I know during the earlier part of the announcement when they were talking about the Home Mini and the Home and the Home Max, that they were announcing that parents could set up accounts for their children on the Google devices and they would tailor even the way that it talks to that person, it would tailor it to a, an experience more suitable for someone under the age of 13. So it would like be more like fun and like there's more mini games and like more little educational experiences and stuff like that. And it's way, fo it's more focused on being like a, like a learning perspective. And this kind of plays into that because most of the photos they show are like in situations where there's like kids playing or like family moments right. that you'd want to capture and stuff like that. And they're taking the assistant and making it way more applicable towards like mm -hmm. the family situation. Yeah. And I, apparently I see the marketing it that way, but I think the practical use will be that it's non-invasive. It's easy to put up somewhere. It'll be easy for, for vloggers to take it around. You can travel with it. You can put it on a plane. People won't see it. You can have it like over here. You can put it up in front. It's non-invasive. It's not in front of your face yeah. all the time. So mm -hmm. I think they, they're marketing it, like you said, to a certain, like, oh, we want to get the family perspective here, but I think it'll be used for something totally different, honestly. Yeah. But it, it doesn't actually shoot videos, which is interesting. So it doesn't shoot video. So you can't just press record and it'll say, shoot, shoot like a five minute video straight. All it does is record. Um, I don't know if you, uh, iPhone users are familiar with this, but the uh, live photos, it uses a version of that. It's called Google Clip or... Um, uh, motion photos that the Google calls them. So it's, it's just mm -hmm. a, a, a video, a, a short video without audio. Um, I mean, like two or a couple seconds, like through three or four seconds. I don't know how long the, the live videos are um, for um, iPhones. Yeah, it's a few seconds. Just a few seconds. Yeah. So that's all it does. It doesn't capture videos. Th this Google Clips device doesn't do that video. All it does is just capture those smart the short bursts of several seconds of, of video and without well, what's audio the format of outputs hmm? what's the format i i it's google's own motion photos format and then you can extract individual pictures from that uh, video or you can just save that whole that entire like small short burst yeah. of the lot motion photo and uh, all these uh, you can generate uh, like gives uh, will be yeah, you can generate GIFs. You can export into like just a regular movie file and yeah, just yeah. post it onto. Yeah, so it would be, be solid B roll. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm assuming with the AI built in, it's probably got a really good stabilization feature as yeah. well. Yeah, I wonder if it's a similar camera to one of the Pixels. Like, I wonder if it's using a similar camera. Either way, I'm, but, I'm very intrigued with what this. Yeah. they call will... that technology that looks for those moments. They call it Moment IQ. To... <laughs> That's what that, that's like their name for the technology, but, um, all the, of course, for anyone who's looking at, into one, joining one of the wait lists that are currently available for one of these products or reading more into it, there's, we'll have all of the product links and the show notes on the Google store. And I literally just joined the wait list for the clips, by the way. <laughs> oh, you did? Yeah. Nice. I'd be curious to see how that works. So we're just, we're just going to review them all, everything from this keynote. How's looking right now? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh man ryan you want to buy a google home max <laughs> <laughs> oh i wish i had enough money i'd, I'd get it man yeah but um but no yeah. that's it's seriously good tech 
Let's skip ahead to another one we're going to review. Yes. <laughs> the Pixel Buds. The Pixel Buds. I believe we have three members of i who will be reviewing these. Is that is that right, Irvin? Uh, yes. Per- perhaps. Perhaps. Are we close to the five at this point? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Could be by the end of it. So not Could at this be. point, necessarily. Maybe if we talk it up enough. Yeah. But um, <laughs> depending on how the segment goes. Well, these... I'm psyched for these. Right. These earbuds uh, have two big features that I wanted to that, mm-hmm. that I think is going to be a game changer for um, for just the competition for the AirPods because that's what the market is. Yeah, and sure. there's there's a, a a huge difference, an elephant in the room, if you'd like. Uh, I'd like to get out of the way, which is the Google Translate ability. Yeah. I don't know if you guys are as hyped for this as I am, but I am like. This is some next level announcement stuff. It's like the babble fish from yeah. Hitchhiker's Guide, where like yeah. yes, exactly. Put, put the fish in your ear, and then it can read all languages. Mm-hmm. And it's oh, it's I mean, the universal translator from Star Trek. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know the Rosetta Stone. We haven't seen this in action quite yet, at least besides on stage at the conference itself. Um, but I'm eager to see how it does with 40 different languages that they boast, um, and with one to two seconds delay, I mentioned to you guys in a text message that got a, a chuckle out of at least a few of you. I, I can't wait to use this in an elevator and see what kind of trash is being talked on. Me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think this is just one of the coolest announcements because it, it's what I'm passionate about, which is tying technology to society and human existence and that bridging of the gap between the language barrier that so many countries, nationalities, et cetera, um, that, that just divides so many people because they can't communicate clearly. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to see what something like this does, especially as it progresses and becomes, you know, a product with less and less latency. And I know that people have attempted this before, um, this, the smart earbud, where they can do translation. There was a product that um, I, I can't remember the name. But it was just like giant tube looking Bluetooth headset thing that stuck out of one of your ears that attempted to translate. And that was pretty bad, but that was coming from a third party. It's not coming from Google. So I kind of give Google the benefit of the doubt here, but um, I'm really hoping that one of the 40 languages that they're initially rolling out is Hungarian. So that way we can <laughs> test it <laughs> with Irvin because we have a native uh, Hungarian speaker on the yes. podcast. So yeah, I would love to right. love to test it and see how it Here's my plan with that. Let's uh let's find some some exploits on a server and report them and see if we can talk ourselves out of getting arrested. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do it through Kaspersky. Uh-huh. <laughs> but um oh, sorry. <laughs> but I think that um it will be it's great because I don't know if we touched on it, but when you do the translation, you can actually speak back into the earbuds and it will output mm-hmm. the sound of the translation in audio from the phone so it works together with the phone which is in i think an important part of it because it has to have this feature this translation feature is only available on the pixels even though these pixel buds are uh compatible with uh ios devices as well as uh, other android devices but this translation feature is exclusive to uh the pixel phones that includes the original as well not just these new new ones uh but the way that it works is you talk through your native language in through the pixel buds and then the translated text will be uh, spoken out of your phone and then the person answering back in their language which you don't understand answers back into the phone and then the the language that you do understand will be played in your ear and then you can have that sort of conversation not really not in real time just yet but fairly damn close uh which is really really impressed me on stage mm-hmm. um, just imagine how many more business deals are going to get done because of like the ability yeah. to just talk to people that you couldn't talk to before yeah. instantly like it's and especially uh, since it's backed by an ai it'll only get better yeah it it like this is the thing that i know like there's so much hype and everything i'm like oh it was so good it was so good this was the thing that blew my mind. I was like, this is what, like you said, it's the, the instant translator from Star Trek. And it's like everything that, that we've wanted to have communication wise between countries, between uh, people with different languages. Like it's, 
this is the thing. This is the thing that made me say, like you said earlier, Jeff, like the future's here. Okay. This is the thing that's like, whoa, I can't believe we're here. Yeah. Live translations is incredible. And yeah. it's all, it, and like this conference has just like, it was one, like one huge step forward for whatever market they were um, disrupting after another. And mm -hmm. I was thoroughly impressed. Yep. So they were also touting the, the uh, audio quality of it. I'm very interested to actually see what the audio quality is, how good it sounds, how good the bass is, how mids and the highs yeah. as well. Because I, I, I know those headphones are really, really bass heavy, but they, they mute out all the other types of sounds. So I, I want to see how well these are actually performing uh, with all yeah. types of different music. Some uh, some of the initial reviewers were saying that it actually sounds very nice. Mm -hmm. um, but the one important thing to note is it's not an in-ear yeah. earbud. It's kind of more of an on-ear style earbud. So you're going to get a lot of bleed from the outside world. So it's good if you're looking to like have a good pair of headphones to go running with or to maybe have some productivity with where um, you kind of need to hear your environment around you a little bit more. But... It's not going to be targeted at like the audiophile who's looking for a noise canceling pair of earbuds that's mm -hmm. going to be this like groundbreaking audio experience. Yeah. And then the one other feature is, of course, Google Assistant is built right into these uh, Google uh, Pixel Buds. So mm -hmm. as soon as you, you can trigger the Google Assistant right on just by tapping the earbud, there's no need to wait for any beeps or anything to co confirm that it's starting to listen as soon as you press it it's listening uh, for your commands so you can initiate a playlist send text messages make calls um and pretty much anything that google assistant can do on your phone uh you could do through the pixel bud so you can in theory not just keep your phone in your pocket and and do a lot of things uh directly also through the um, buds if you have an iPhone and you purchase this, it will trigger Siri, which is something else that's kind of a, a little bit of a side note as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really cool mm -hmm. that they that they kind of made it available to all users. So yeah, but you only get the the translate if you have a Pixel, and then you only get the Google Assistant if you have an Android device that supports yeah. it. Yeah, you know, I, I think the thing have... that I'm most excited about when it comes to this, especially with the translate feature, is Five years from now, when the generation before us and the generation before them uh, are mad at us because back in their day, they had to learn a language and take the time to study it. So I'm <laughs> most excited for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you lazy millennials, you guys and your technology. There they go again. <laughs> Can't wait. So excited to have that argument. <laughs> yeah, just another, just another reason. Back in my day, I had to buy a phone to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, miles to the Verizon store. Back yeah. in my day, we copy and paste it into Google, not just <laughs> edit. Probably <laughs> gonna. Oh man! But um, I think that's all of it. Well, wait, maybe. Uh, you're, we you're missing one. the daydream yeah, view. Yeah, the daydream view. Yeah. We missed yeah, that one. one. It's just the next iteration of their VR headset. There's, no, there's nothing really groundbreaking to write home with this. Um, I mean, it's something I'm curious to check out mm -hmm. now that I'm taking the plunge. Yeah. Go and it's step, yeah, step it. into the, the mobile VR uh, space. Because I know you, you said you were excited to try something in the VR. Yeah, to and see how that Matt, is. Matt and I talked uh, on length for that second half of the one episode yeah. we did together. Um, and I've been itching and itching to get into VR and AR in a way where I don't have to drop several hundred dollars on a headset. Mm -hmm. um, and this is an option where it's $99, I believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, you know, you, you can, looks like they're mostly plugging games for now, but I'm... I used, yeah, I used Google Cardboard with my 6P and that was great. And that was before Daydream VR and Daydream VR is supposed to be even better than that. So... Yeah. I'm I'm really excited to see what this is like, and one of the first things I'm going to do when I do get my upgrade is to check out how I can get some kind of 
recording going on with this so i can show you guys what i see and yeah. let you know how it was yeah that'd be awesome yeah yeah, you... yeah. but um with that being said i think that kind of is all there is to cover from the google event Woo! from, from the event what? itself yeah you guys want to touch while we're on the subject of vr on lens at all we can but we could also... um lens was something they covered a little bit it was more they covered it more at length in the last conference they had with the was it the original pixel urban when they announced the lens or was that um was that at a later conference they announced no, that was a uh, google io io yeah. right okay google okay. io is when they uh talked about uh lens and what that will bring um, yeah, and the and they said fall, so that it looks like Google Lens will be launching with the uh, Pixel Two. Um, so looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, do, you guys, do you guys remember Google Goggles from back yes. in the day? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. this is Google Goggles on steroids, I think. If you want to it think is. of it that way. Yeah, it sounds pretty. Um, like, I was super stoked about this too. So mm -hmm. this is not something where it's like, oh, if you make the cut, you get access to this. This is like. Only if you have a Pixel 2, or I think it's just Pixel 2 for now, you get to try it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm that, jealous. That's awesome. If, if you're Thanks. wanting to jump on this new phone, you get to check out this awesome new software coming out. I'm Kyle, don't buy into the cult of personality. If you want an iPhone 10, you can have an iPhone 10. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you don't you have to buy into this. You don't I'm going to be shunned on the podcast in, the, in like the next few months, aren't I? Shame. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I apologize. I apologize. <laughs> An ad played on our on our <laughs> on one of our links there. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> they're getting rid of that in January. I was going to talk about I'm that. You think Chrome would be ready? Yeah. Enough. We'll be there yeah. soon. January 2018. Chrome's getting rid of sound and tabs, but. And we'll test it live when I open that same link on January 18th. <laughs> yes. <of the> <laughs> I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> I gotta go back to the notes. Wow, what episodes did I say that in? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, okay. I think that's all we had for the Google conference. Anyone have any final mar remarks before I uh, touch on some plug notes here and close it out? So the overall yeah. view, I think, on this entire Google uh, conference was that Google is really going hard on making this their own so uh, hardware. Um, we talked about couple last episode a couple episodes back that they acquired 2,000 employees from HTC's pixel team um, and this is the just was the first step in Google getting serious about the hardware game and not just putting out great hardware but as an ecosystem as a whole making everything work nicely so if you want to jump in I know Apple has if you want to use every single product that they offer all of those products tied together really nicely. I think Google now has all the components of an Apple level type of ecosystem and they're really mm -hmm. working to build that out. And this conference really showed that, hey, we're serious about this. We're gonna make uh, everything work together nicely. Um, all the hardware is really high quality from what we've seen, uh, works well together. Um, so I'm really excited about what Google will offer in, in terms of the future of their hardware developments. Now they have an in-house hardware team. Um, so it, it really excited for what the future has to right. uh, hold for Google in terms of hardware. Yeah. That was my take from the, this conference. I mean, it's definitely a big move for them. They're, they're making a lot of moves. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think Google's been a software space, but yeah, yeah. I agree, Irvin. Any, anyone else? Any any other comments? No, that's all that I had. <laughs> I'm well, all Googled out. With that, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do the plugs for everybody, if no one minds. Um, first of all, for uh, all of us here at Industry 4.0, you can access us on uh, multiple mediums, as Kyle mentioned, coming back from the break. Uh, you can find us on Podbean at Industry 4.0, all spelled out, .podbean.com, on Google Play and iTunes at Industry 4.0. 
and on Facebook and Twitter. You can find us at Industry 40, again, spelled out. Uh, all music in this episode, including the intro, the break, and the outro music, is produced by yours truly, Jeff Budzinski. You can find me on SoundCloud at a new URL at soundcloud.com slash the J Bones. Uh, you could also check out our very own Kyle Fisher's uh, wrestling podcast, which is called On Air with Keenan and Kyle at http colon slash slash on air with Keenan dot podomatic dot com. Also, you can enjoy the wonderful, always enjoyable, and absolutely breathtaking photography of our own Wayne Ryan Thompson at www.flickr.com slash photo slash Wayne R. Thompson. And the only one I'm going to give up here is Irvin. I, I don't know your Instagram handle at this time. <laughs> My Instagram is uh, Instagram.com slash Irvin.Lucas, E-R-V-I-N dot L-U-K-A-C-S. Uh, with that, there you have it. We got a talented group here. We thank you as always for joining us for another episode of Industry 4.0. This has been episode 22. I hope you all are as excited as we are about the announcements we've had this week. We hope to have you again next week. Thanks, everybody.